All right, we're back into the, the book of Hebrews. We're going to pick it up in chapter 4. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Referring all the way back to uh, Israel when they came out over the Red Sea. If you uh, remember, we talked about it last week, and we'll probably talk it about it again. Uh, just going back into where we've been. So previously at Grace, we were in chapter one, which we saw Jesus being revealed for who he was in his person, that he is the son of God, that there is no other. And we saw his supremacy in all things uh, over, the, over the fathers, over the prophets. We saw in chapter two that Jesus was made lower, that he who was in heaven at creation, who created all things and all things were created by him and for him, that he stepped down and became a man, a man which is even lower than the angels. And Jesus did that in order to purchase our lives. And that's the, that's the good news, isn't it? That's the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter three, we talked about unbelief, like the people in Israel who came over the Red Sea and saw all these miracles, and yet they didn't mix what they saw with faith. And because of that, they were prevented from going into the promised land, the land that was theirs, that was given to them by God, that the Lord said, go in and take it. It's yours. Gave them boundaries, told them exactly what was their parcel. And they never even went and took about 15% of it, which is uh, kind of sad, but we'll talk about that. So what we've seen is Jesus basically is the greatest, not Muhammad Ali. And that Jesus is greater than, and we've gone through the fathers, the prophets. It's much slower than I can remember. Angels. You remember, to which one of the angels did he ever say, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool? And so Jesus is not an angel. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than mankind. And yet he took a, he took a step down. He took a step down and became us so that he might redeem us, that he would be tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin. We saw that Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the law because the law was never designed to perfect anybody. It just showed you your imperfections. Amen? Amen. You know, when you see that speed limit sign and you look at your speedometer, that signs to show you that you, you got to augment your, your life. Oh, not many of you. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Jesus is better than the high priest and the whole sacrificial system that was set up by God himself. Jesus supersedes all of that. We're going to look at some of that today and also next week. The Sabbath, that Jesus is our rest. And we're going to talk about that this week and that Jesus is better than Joshua because he is able to get us into the promised land. Every one of us who mixes what we know about Jesus with faith and put it into action by putting our faith in him. So that's what we're going to talk about this week. Jesus is greater. That's basically the sum of the book of Hebrews. So I don't have to speak anymore because you guys now know it and I don't need to tell you. Remember last week we were in chapter three. Beware, brethren, now, this is to us, the church, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. So we're supposed to patrol our hearts, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So we have been told by the scriptures, be careful of our hearts. Any of you know what, it, what he's talking about? When your heart goes astray, you know, when you look at things you shouldn't have or things you can't afford and you allow your affections to kind of go in that direction. Okay, good. I'm not the only one. You know, the new iPhone is out. Oh, there it is. Okay, I found the point. There it is. There are so many new things that we can get excited about and set our affections on. And the scripture says, be careful that you don't set your affections on things that you really shouldn't set your affections on because you're going to break your heart because you're not going to get it. Or if you do get it, it'll ruin you. So control your heart. Be careful for who having heard rebelled in the wilderness. Well, they, they all rebelled except for two. Indeed. Was it not all who came out of Egypt? led by Moses. You see, they were all led out of slavery, but they weren't all led into the promised land because they didn't 
put it put together faith with it. Now, with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? I don't know about you, but I don't want to live a life where God's angry at me because I'm not taking his word literally and mixing it with faith and stepping forward. Verse 18, and to whom did he swear that, he would, that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? And so you see that they could not enter because of unbelief. And I made the statement, there are a lot of people who are on the right side of the Red Sea, but they're on the wrong side of the Jordan. Because God designed us to be free from our sin, not to wander around the wilderness for 40 years in unbelief, but to move into the victorious Christian life, which is what Canaan represents. It doesn't represent heaven because there's no wars in heaven, right? And that's their rest, believe it or not. Their rest was to go to battle and take the land. That doesn't sound like rest to me. How many of you like to work? Okay. You know what it's like when you're in your zone and you're doing the thing that you're good at and boom, 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 boom. You know what that's like? That's exciting. Listen, what do you, you need a rest from that? It's, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life, right? That's what they say. That was the rest. And we'll talk about that this week. So we've looked at the alarms, the warnings that go through the book of Hebrews. And today we're going to talk about doubting and disobedience. So there are seven warnings in Hebrews. If any of you are paying attention, you'll notice up to this point there were six. I added one. And it began with a D. So how did I not? Anyway, verse one, therefore, since a promise remains for entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Now, this is an exhortation to us as Christians not to come short of the life that God wants us to live. It's not a, it's not a call to the unbeliever to say, hey, listen, you better believe in Christ. Or you're going to miss the boat. That's not the deal. This is about sanctification. This is about taking it to the next level. And if you misread Hebrews, you'll think, oh no, I got to work real hard and get saved. I got to remember Jesus. I got to give him my life and I, uh, or else I'll, make, I'll miss the boat. And people misread the scriptures that way. This is about sanctification of those who are already believers. And we're going to show that as we look at the scriptures. And yet they are thinking about stepping back into the religious system of Judaism and going back to what is just a shadow and a type of what Christ is the fulfillment of. And so that certainly applies to us, doesn't it? Amen. Because we have to be careful. Our hearts don't get hard. And although we've been delivered from sin and we've been taken out of Egypt, not many of us, I got to say, enter into the life that God really means for us because we don't believe that God really wants us to do that. Right? You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about going to the next level. So rest, according to John Owen, is all of these things. It's peace with God. It means freedom from servile bondage to the, uh, the bondage-like spirit of the worship and the service of, to God. It means rest is deliverance from the burden of the Mosaic observance. Rest means freedom from worship according to the that means freedom of worship according to the gospel and rest means the rest of God that he himself enjoys. And so there are several different things. Actually, the author uses two different words for the word rest here in Hebrews. And one of them is not used anywhere else in the New Testament. Uh, the word for rest here is kataposis, like a cat paw. I was going to put a picture of that up there so you'd remember this Greek word. Kataposis. Everybody say kataposis. You're speaking in tongues again. Cataposis. It's also synonymous with inheritance. So rest is inheritance. If you remember, they were going into the land of Canaan where their rest would be, but that was their inheritance. And you'll notice that they're somewhat synonymous as we run through here. So uh, you, you might have to think about that on more than just a straight level as rest, meaning, oh, it's 530. I finally got home from work. I can kick off my shoes, and put my feet up sort of thing. Rest is following Jesus, not finding Jesus. And you have to remember this as you're reading through the book of Hebrews. It's a book about sanctification, not salvation. Falling short of God's rest does not mean rejecting salvation, but not completely giving ourselves over to be obedient, which is our inheritance. Do you realize that our inheritance is that sin no longer rules in your mortal body? It doesn't push you around and tell you what to do, and you're not a slave to your sin anymore. 
It's one of the signs that you know Christ. Some things change immediately when Jesus comes into your life and other things painstakingly have to be surgically removed from us over a period of time. So you know what I'm talking about. There were certain things that just went and there were certain things that took a long time and they're still taking a long time with me. Um, but I, I'm, I'm the one who has to give them up. It's about following Jesus, not finding him. And the lack of our peace in our lives should cause us to examine ourselves with fear to assess if we truly are in the faith. If I'm walking around and I don't have a sense of peace, if I don't have a sense of rest, if I know that I, if I have this sense that I'm not right with God, I shouldn't just live with that, right? You don't just live with it, you gotta deal with that. I mean, even during communion, I was, I was moved to put my hand on my wife and tell her I love her, you know, to make sure we were okay. I mean, I'm always trying to assess whether my heart's in the right place as God would have it be. And if it's not, it's not something to just live with. It's something that you need to get right, and it might be difficult, and it might be like surgery, but by golly, who, who wants to live with that junk, right? Amen. So the lack of peace in our lives should make us questions. That's why it says, therefore, since a promise remains for entering his rest, let us fear, that, that's phobos, it's, it's like having a phobia. That means you, you should have this deep reverent awe for the fact that you don't have this rest. Right. You should have a desire for it. It's not greedy, by the way lest any of you seem to come short of it. And so that's what we should do. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we're also told, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. So if, if you don't have this sense of, I have peace with God and I don't need everyone to approve of me, you should check your heart. If you don't know that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that you're free of it, you'll start to think things like, oh, I don't know why this hard thing's happening in my life. It feels like God's gone far away. He's punishing me. I know it. Is that right doctrine? No. Absolutely not. It's called double jeopardy because he put all his punishment on his son, didn't he? He put all the punishment that you and I earn on a daily basis. He put on his son. Talk about eating an omelet and feeling bad about people who don't have food. I feel bad that God had to step out of heaven and come and die in my place for my sin. And I still struggle with it. Amen. God, help me. That should do something to a heart, right? Yes. Sorry, forgive me. Verse two, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. He's talking about the Israelites coming over the Red Sea in the desert. But the word in which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. You see, they saw miracles. They saw things that you and I don't see. They saw miracles in front of their, the Red Sea parted and they walked through as though it were on dry ground. And when they got to the other side, the Egyptians tried to come through and the Lord closed it up. Time to zip it up and flooded them out. And you know, there are still those wheels are still at the bottom of that ocean. There are people that have found them. You can go online and see them. They're all encrusted with coral and stuff, but they're there. There's proof. Anybody wants to go down and look at it. You remember the twin towers. I remember that day driving out in Staten Island and seeing them far off. And I saw just a, a faint trail of smoke coming from the top. And it was an especially cool and clear day. And I remember it very clearly. And then the smoke got more and more and more. And I was wondering what that was all about. And you guys know what happened that day. Now, there were people who were warned. There were people who, <laughs> there were people that were driving to work and there were gas station attendants saying, don't go in today. Not conspiracy theory, really, really, really happened. I know people firsthand. Don't go in today. Don't go into work today. How come? People knew about what was going to happen. You and I didn't know. But you know what? The people who didn't listen, things happen. Knowledge and passion mean nothing without action. We have to act on the things that we know, otherwise it doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, you guys know when tax day is? I bet you do, you taxpayers, you. If you don't do anything about it, they'll come find you. You know, your inspection sticker, you know what, you know when it's at, you know what, the year and the month and everything? It, it, you don't do something about it, somebody will pull you over and tell you, you better do something about it. I know, I've had it happen. Passion 
and knowledge without action is worthless. And so the word of God is calling us to action, boys and girls, not just knowledge. Boy, I come to church and I learn all these new things and I put it in the category in the encyclopedia of my mind and I walk around knowing more than everybody else. That is not what we're doing here. Amen? Amen. We're looking for life change. We're looking for God to change us. Your actions demonstrate what you truly believe. If you really believe something, it'll be seen in what you do. If you don't believe it, I'll see that in your actions as well, right? I know you all trust those chairs. You look real comfortable. Faith in words only is not true faith. To say I have a mental assent of something, like people, you'll ask them, say, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus. What they mean is I believe there was a historical figure years ago. His name was Jesus. Or maybe they know somebody in a Spanish family named Jesus. Or maybe they have a friend named De Jesus, which is the same thing. We have three De Jesuses here. Words are a different thing than faith. Faith is demonstrated by action. You will not see somebody's faith other than having action. Hebrews 11.1 1 reminds us that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. The very fact that you know that wind exists has to do with you looking at what the wind does. Not that you can see wind, because you can't see wind. Can you? Amen. You can't see an atom either, but you believe it exists. Amen. You can't see a lot of things that you believe. It's substance. It's evidence. You will see it by what you do. James brings this out in chapter 2 of James. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith by your works, uh, uh, or without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Do you know that the devil believes in God? But it's not going to save him. There are a lot of people who believe in God, but it's not going to save him. There are a lot of people who believe in Jesus, that he's a historical figure that lived years ago. He probably did miracles. He probably did a lot of things. But you know what? It's not going to save him. They have the same faith as the devil because they don't rely upon him. It's not true faith because they don't put their full confidence in him. So the demons believe and tremble. So I don't know if you want to have that kind of faith. I don't. But do you want to know, oh, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see his faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That tells me that if you really believe what the Bible says, you're going to do what the Bible tells you to do. If you don't do it, it's because you don't believe it. And I think we better start putting some action behind our words. Do I care about the souls of unsaved people? Why don't I tell them about Jesus? Well, because my self-preservation kicks in and I don't want them to make fun of me or look at me funny. <laughs> Why don't I pray more for people? Why don't I reach out more for people? Why don't I risk some things? Oh, because I like my comfortable little world. That's why. Well, that becomes your God then. You have to do. If you believe, you have to do. Amen? Amen. And so we're encouraged to do that and mix what we have with faith. Because faith is needed for us to enter the rest that God has for us. If you remember the story in, um, in Numbers, all of them went into the desert for 40 years and wandered around because they didn't believe. And God said, the land over there is yours. And they go, yeah, but there are big, scary people there. He says, okay, don't go. Just wander around. It took them a day. They wept, they cried, they tore their clothes. They were going to go back to Egypt. They wanted to select a new leader, that whole stuff. And then the next day, they came up to Moses and they walked up the mountain and they said, hey, hey, Moses, we're sorry, man. We messed up. 
We're going to go get them. We're going to go kill those Amalekites and those Canaanites and the tick bites and mosquito bites. And we're going to go get them. And, and Moses said, don't do it. You're going to fail. And they said, wait a minute. What do you mean we're going to fail? You said it's ours. We're going to go get it. He goes, yeah, but God told me you're not going to get it anymore. The promised land that he promised to you, you're not getting anymore. God made a promise he didn't keep. No, God made a promise that was conditional. Did Israel go into the land? Of course they did. That's why it's called Israel today. They did go into the land, but it was everyone 20 years and younger. Everyone else dropped dead in the desert because they didn't mingle it with faith. And they said, well, we're going to go in. We're going to do it. And he said, don't do it. God said, you're going to wander around for 40 years for one year for every day that you guys went and checked out the land and came back with no faith. And they said, well, we're going anyway. And they went and guess what happened? They whooped their butt, killed them left and right and ran them back to camp. One day difference. That's all it was. It was just one day difference from, no, we're not going to obey God. Let's get new leaders. Let's kill Caleb and Joshua because we don't like what they're saying. And we're going to go back. And then they mourned and they repented. And one day was too long. That seems harsh, Pastor Dave. It does seem harsh. Did you ever know that you were supposed to do something, but you didn't do it and it came back to bite you? That's why the scripture says the word today, like eight times. In, in Hebrews. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. That's why it says today, because today is hugely important, because today won't come again. And tomorrow is for fools and lazy people. I'll do it tomorrow. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Today, while it is today. For we who have believed do enter that rest. By the way, that's a statement of fact. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you have entered into his rest. Amen. Period. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now it's a little different. He's talking about his rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. He's talking about six days of creation. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Any of you confused? <laughs> he's like a lawyer, okay? And he's, he's building one thing upon another. Number one, God took a rest on the seventh day, right? You, you remember in Genesis chapter two? I think it is. I wish I was better at this. So God is inviting us into his rest. Isn't that interesting? His rest. This is a slightly different wording than before. God made the world in six days. Why? That's true. There are lots of things that roll downhill from there. But why did he choose six days? He could have built it in one day. He could have went, boom, done. Disney World. I mean, he could have done anything, right? Why six days? He was setting a principle for us. He did all of that in a particular structure as a show and tell thing for us. Because he could have done it in a day, but he didn't. God made the world in six days. Was God tired on the seventh day? He's like, oh, man. That was tough. <laughs> I created the universe, all the stars, all the planets, gravity, time, space, matter. I created all these things, black holes, supernovas. I'm exhausted. No. Why, why on the seventh day did he rest? It was a show and tell thing for you and I. You know, you got to take one of seven. That doesn't matter to me which day it is, but you got to take one and seven off. If you work, 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 they've actually done scientific studies to back up what the scripture says. You should take some time off because if you don't, you're in deep trouble. Your body was not created by someone who designed it to go 24-7. Try running your car like that. So why did God do this? I think it was all for us on purpose. I'll ask you a, a theological question. How long was the seventh day? 
It's a trick question. It's a trick question. You're in the seventh day. You're in the seventh day. It says on the seventh day, God rested from all the work that he had done. Period. Doesn't say there was morning and evening. There was a seventh day. Doesn't say that at all. God stopped all the creative work that he had done on the seventh day. And guess what? It's the same today. With the exception of Jesus doing miracles and that kind of thing, God is done doing anything new and creating anything new. Everything that's here is here, unless it's in human beings. But God rested on the seventh day. In other words, he stopped, he ceased from all the work that he was doing. You might imply it was a 24-hour period, but today is God's rest. He's still resting. And it says, we enter into his rest. What does that mean? That means you should have so much less stress than Jersey puts upon you. I'm sure I'll argue with you guys about this later, but in Genesis 2, 23, this is the scripture. On the seventh day, God ended his work in which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work. In other words, he stopped. For God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it, because in it, he, res he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. In the original Hebrew, it means he stopped doing all the things he was doing. And it's still today. We're in his rest right now. The seventh day is now. And when you enter into Christ, you enter into his rest. Why aren't we so religious about the Sabbath day, about Saturday? Because we're in the seventh day. It's probably a little over your heads. But Jesus is greater than the Sabbath, isn't it? Jesus is greater than the Sabbath. And in keeping with Jesus is greater, the theme of the book, Jesus is greater than the Sabbath. And the rest that he gives is a spiritual rest where the seventh day is only a physical rest, which doesn't make it less necessary, but it's certainly necessary. But without a spiritual rest, what's a physical rest? What does a profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose a soul? Or what does a man give in exchange for his soul? I mean, without spiritual rest, you can be well rested, but go to hell. No, thanks. I'd rather be worn out and go to heaven. Amen. But that's not the choice. I can enter into his rest and I can do those things that he's called me to do. And he can give me the strength to do all those things he calls me to do. And that's our inheritance. I'm sorry. I was way more excited about this than you. <laughs> Chapter six, or I'm sorry, verse six. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it and those whom it was preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day saying in David today, after such a long time as it has been said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. How many of you are confused? Just one, two people. Okay. Then I'll roll three. Okay. I'll, I'll roll on for three. Here's the thing. He says, I want you to enter into my rest. They didn't enter into his rest. And he says, I'm not going to let you enter into my rest. And yet if God invites us into his rest and yet somebody's not there, then that means that it, the invitation's still open for somebody to fill those shoes. Make sense? If I said to everybody, hey, listen, I'm going to have somebody over here to my house for dinner. And I invited a couple and, and they said, sorry, I can't make it. And I asked another couple and I said, and, and they couldn't make it. Then the offer still stands that, I have an opening at my table for somebody. You see, and that's what he's saying. There's a time in which he said, rest, come enter into your rest. But then the Lord said, I will not let you into my rest. And then David later on, thousands of years later, mentions this scripture in Psalm 91, entering into the rest. And so apparently nobody's entered it yet. There's still a slot open. That's essentially what he's saying. Psalm 95, this is a Psalm of David. And he says, he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, there's that word today. Do not harden your hearts as in rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and tried me. And though they saw my work for 40 years, I was grieved with that generation and said, it is, peop it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So God said, enter into your rest. And they didn't enter into the rest. And so guess what? There is a rest for the people of God that hasn't been entered into yet, at least historically. Don't be one day late. The message that I understand from the, the numbers passage is 
when the Lord speaks to you today, <laughs> don't delay. I just made that up. <laughs> if God speaks to you today, do not delay because there's a timing aspect that's important and we will reap the benefits of it and it will give glory to God, obviously. That's in Numbers 13 and 14 if you want to read that story. So hearing God's voice today is his invitation to rest. You know, during communion, if the Lord puts somebody on your heart that you need to talk to, that's not, a, that's not an invitation to a sit-down conflict. Oh, gee, I can't believe it. The Lord's telling me I got to go talk to this person. He's inviting you into rest because on the other side of that is rest. And we don't see it that way. We say, oh, I hate conflict. I have to go talk to so-and-so. And you know what that's going to be like. And then you invent all sorts of ideas and you talk yourself out of it. Well, at least I do. <laughs> you people are way nicer than me. But hearing God's voice today is his invitation to rest. We should understand that. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have afterwards spoken of another day, meaning David. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. You see, there's the rest that God has called the people of Israel into, which is the land of Canaan. And then there's the rest, which is God's rest. We enter into God's rest when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Because he's the one who has completed everything that's needed for us to be acceptable to God. And we cease from trying to be good enough, trying to be smart enough, and, you know, trying to rest, dress well, you know, and get other people to like us. You know, we stop from our works of trying to be good enough and we rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's the rest that we're told to be in. Ephesians 2, 8 and, 9, uh, 8, 9 and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. And in other words, not of your own self-fulfilling, self-justifying works. Lest anyone should boast. Because we can go before God and say, well, I'm good enough. Why should I let you into heaven? Well, because I'm good enough. There's nobody going to say that with, with any sense of reality. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's why God did a work in us so that we could do stuff. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, it's no longer trying to be good enough, trying to look good enough, trying to pretend to be something you're not. You know, it's so easy to come into church and put a smile on your face and say, praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> While your heart's broken. Jesus doesn't want that. What he wants you to do is be real. Now, he doesn't want you to dump all your beans on somebody's brain, but you know what I'm saying, right? Okay. You can be real because Jesus saved you. He paid the price up on the cross. In John 19, 30, if you remember the the, what Jesus said from the cross. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Jesus voluntarily died for you. Amen. And if you were the only person on the face of the earth, he would do it for you all over again. But his blood is enough for everyone. There is none that he will cast out. None. If they come to him, the scripture says so. It is, the, it is that broken and contrite spirit that the Lord will never cast away. Verse 11, so let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Here's a call to arms again for those of us brothers and sisters. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. I want to explain the difference between unconditional and conditional promises. I had a conversation with somebody yesterday. Not all promises in the Bible are for you. <gasps> what? Not all the promises in the Bible are for you. Oh, you heretic. Let's go shopping for stones. There are certain things that are said to certain people at certain times. There are principles about who God is that we can derive from that. And you can rest on that. I'm going to throw one at you. He who began a good work in you will continue it into the day of Jesus Christ. Is that about you or about the Philippians? 
It's about you because he's, the principle is that God continues the work he started in a human being. It's not just to the Philippians. Now, this is, this is it's called exegesis and hermeneutics and all these big words. And being able to take the scriptures and divide it rightly so that you understand what applies to you and what doesn't apply to you. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Is that a guarantee that when you bring up your kids in the scriptures that they will get saved? There are some people that believe it is. When Paul and Silas were in prison and suddenly the whole place shook because they were worshiping God and God took pleasure in it. And he said, well, let, let's do something. And he shook the place up and all the gates opened up and their shackles fell off. And the Philippian jailer said, I'm dead. I'm a dead man. I'm, I, I don't know what to do. And so he pulls out his sword and he goes to run himself through. And Paul says, don't, 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 don't do that. We're all here. And he goes out and he shares the gospel with him and he receives Christ as a savior. The guy takes them home and washes their wounds and he preaches the gospel to their household and they all get saved. They all accept Jesus Christ as Lord and savior. And he told the Philippian jailer, he says, you will believe in your whole household. Amen. Wow. Does that mean if you get saved, your whole household's going to get saved? There are people that say so. So there are all kinds of things in the scriptures, guys, that we can argue about all day long. Does this apply to you? Does it not apply to you? There are some people that apply all of the scriptures are yes and amen. All of God's promises are yes and amen, but they don't necessarily apply to you. Some of them are unconditional where God says, I'm doing this. Like with Abraham, when he made a covenant with Abraham, Abraham prepared the sacrifice. He sat and waited and waited and waited and waited fell asleep, woke up, suddenly God showed up and he made a covenant with Abraham that had nothing to do with Abraham's response. That's an unconditional promise. A conditional promise is if you do this, then I'll do that. If you're obedient, you'll take the land. But if you're disobedient, I will raise up nations to come in and take you over to be slaves. And that's exactly what happened because Israel was not obedient. So there are conditional and unconditional promises in the scripture. Make sense? Amen. You tell your kid, listen, I'll give you 50 bucks, but you got to rake the leaves. And he comes in looking for 50 bucks and the leaves aren't up. Guess what? You got to rake the leaves. <laughs> and guess what? You missed your window of opportunity because the landscapers are next door. I'm going to have them do it. No, 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 don't do that. That's exactly what happened with Israel. There are conditional and unconditional promises in the Bible. Make sure that you know the difference. What we're looking at here is an encouragement to be diligent so that we can enter the rest, the kind of a life where we're walking in the spirit of God and not in the flesh. That is the exhortation here in the book of Hebrews. So unconditional and conditional promises. You know, you can fall as a Christian. It says it right here. Make sure you don't fall according to the same example of disobedience. It can happen. Do bad things happen in our lives? Yeah. Is God punishing you? Absolutely not. Is he training you? Because he disciplines those he loves. All these in faith, not having all these died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them and embraced them. This is going forward to Hebrews 11. We'll get there someday and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Do you see what they did? It says by faith, these people did something, but you see, it wasn't that God just moved them like pawns. They had to react and they had to be obedient to do what God called them to do for God to do the thing he did. God can do anything he wants, but there are some things that he won't do without you because he's asked you to do them. All power and authority has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Is Jesus going to do that apart from you? No, he's going to do it in concert with you. Does God need you? Nah. He could take me out and make another one look just like me. But he wants to team up. And I think that's an awesome thing. So we have a response. We have action. In Philippians 2, 12 and 13, it says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's something we're supposed to do with a deep reverence, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. 
So we're supposed to do what God has called us to do. And we're supposed to do it with diligence and hard work. Amen? Amen. Knowing that it's God in us, causing us to will and to do for his good pleasure. So what happens if I don't feel like it? God must not want me to repent of this sin. So I'll just keep beating my wife because I just don't have it in me. He's not causing me to will anything. Well, guess what? Die to yourself, bro. That's what the scripture says. Be obedient. That's what we're, trust and obey. There's no better way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Some of you Sunday school people know this. God's sovereignty and human responsibility meet. We don't know where, we can't figure it out, but I know I have a responsibility. How about you? And so I want to respond to that in a right way. And Lord Jesus Christ, I am so behind the schedule here. I'm going to stop it right here and we're not going to get through the whole chapter. Okay. (laughs) I hope I have encouraged you guys to understand that God puts a challenge for each one of us to do those things he's asked us to do. And I don't want to be like one of those who are in the wilderness who, because I didn't believe God and I didn't think I could do a certain thing that God wanted me to do, that I held back. I'll share a small story and then the worship team can come up. 11 years ago, I found a church. It was on the verge of closing. There were about 25 people that were still going. The pastor had left in a hurry. And I felt God calling me to come alongside this church. It's Grace Bible Fellowship. I I didn't do it for the money. I didn't do it for notoriety. I didn't do it for any of the reasons, but I believe God called me to do it. And I believe that God could resurrect this church because that's the kind of God we serve. And look at all you happy people. So much better than me. Because I believed God. Simple thing. Simple, small thing. And it's not anything that I did. It's everything he did. If we would only believe. If we would only say, Lord, I'm going to trust you on this. And I'm going to take a step out. Oh, yeah, but what if you're wrong, brother? What if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? Are we so afraid of being wrong that we won't step out? I'm going to do what the Lord's called me to do. I hope you have that conviction in your heart. I hope the Holy Spirit's done that for you today. That there are, listen, the Lord has mountains for us to conquer. And Caleb at 80 years old, 85 years old says, pick me boss. I'll go. I'm just as strong as I was 45 years ago, man. (laughs) Give me that mountain. I'll cast those giants out. And you know what he did? Don't, don't you want to live that life? Man, I'm 61 years old and I don't have a whole lot more time left. Just like today's service, things go very quickly. I'm going to pray as the worship team comes up. Father God, I pray that you might speak to our hearts that while it is today that we would react to the thing that you put on our heart today. As we look at those who have come before us, those who have walked in faith and conquered lands and subdued people and won victories for your name's sake and for your glory, I pray, Lord, that we might be added to that list, every one of us, that we would be a demonstration of your power and of your love to this lost world. Lord, there is so much riding on it. And I don't want to be under condemnation or give any. But Lord, you have called us to a high calling. I pray that you might give us the encouragement and the strength to step out in faith to do what you've called us to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior.